Well, today we are talking about the venerable Vale Villa. It is the house, the structure that's been in Orange Vale uh, pretty much the longest. There's a, there's a handful that we're still digging into, but this was one of the oldest houses, uh, structures in Orange Vale. And we have quite a bit of history. We have 30 minutes to cover this villa and there's, there's just so much information, it's, it's challenging. So what I've done is tried to get a, a good overview, get some really good nuggets in here and help people understand where it has been, <laughs> who's been in it and uh, where it's at right now. So with that, we will uh, get into it. First thing to, uh, to notice is uh, we had a pretty much a real estate uh, project. It was a business, right? the Orangeville Colony. We had a bunch of 10 acre parcels that they were looking to uh, jot up. You know, we have the north, south, east, west uh, ro roads. We have 10 acre parcels in chunks of four in between those roads. And in fact, behind me, you can see the, the map they had. And we'll be getting into that a little bit where you see all the little squares. Those are all 10 acre parcels. And that's what they were selling. They were promoting this agricultural suburb, a um, utopia, if you will, to get out of the city in the late 1800s when you had the Industrial Revolution, you had people like just tired of the city. We've never heard that before, right? Uh, escaping San Francisco or escaping Chicago. Well, that was happening back in that day. And they were looking to um, take advantage of that as a business venture. So we had Weinstock and Hall and different folks that were part of this organization, McClatchy, uh, Katzitstein. And so they were promoting this place. And one of the things they did as they were trying to figure out how to get the word out to folks, a lot of people back east they were trying to draw here, they came up with a souvenir of Orangevale. And they printed this in 1894. And this is one of the first uh, photographs we have of the villa. And this up on the top left, you'll see, is the villa. If you recognize that, if you've ever driven by it, where it's currently at on Oak Avenue. Uh, but they had, uh, this is one of the advertisements they had in the paper. So they were promoting, hey, we'll send you this neat little pamphlet. It was about uh, a little bit larger than a three by five card and it had uh, multiple pages. We were very fortunate that the California room has an original copy of this in their rare books uh, section. And that's where Paul uh, Sandel, who published the Orangevale book, he got a lot of his old pictures from that pamphlet. So we have access to that as well. I took pictures of each page carefully and uh, we have that in one of our repositories for our research team to get a hold of. There's a lot of good information in there. Um, but we're focused today on the villa. And so they were promoting this amazing uh, place. Uh, let's see here. Let me disappear that. There we go. So this is a, uh, a little blurb. It's hard to see from there, but I'll, I'll read it to you so you can, to, you can understand it. It says, the upper left-hand corner of the group is an excellent representation of the villa erected by the company upon its town site at a point overlooking the river and its broad stretches at the base of the bluff from which glimpses of scenery are obtained, which once viewed can never be forgotten. Sounds pretty impressive, right? Yeah, it's, uh, so this was originally set up on a bluff and that's something we'll be looking at today to see exactly where that was originally placed. Going a little bit further into the souvenir, um, they use the, the words pretentious edifice. It's, uh, he can't see me quite as good with that, but uh, it's okay, Ken says okay. Uh, so you see here a number of the original houses that were in the colony. And we'll have, of course, a, uh, I think uh, Pam's already looking at this one going, there it is. <laughs> Was that on the sell flyer? I'm sorry? Was that on the purchaser's sell flyer? This was in the souvenir of Orangevale, the, the pamphlet. Oh, good. Yeah, it's in the pamphlet, yeah. So they had a picture of some of the houses. Uh, we know at least three of these still exist, and uh, which is very cool. We'll be, of course, doing more presentations on the different houses of Orangevale. And so we have a little bit more information here. But we're focused on the villa today, <laughs> which is in the bottom left. And they talk about it being uh, the most pretentious edifice of the Swiss villa pattern. So they talked about it being a Swiss villa. 
and they said it cost about 4000 to uh, duplicate, which is pretty expensive for those days. And in fact, when you look at the annual report from the Orangevale Colonization Company in 1889, uh, it mentions the villa. And the villa, uh, on their books, they decided to bump up the price a little bit. They decided in their assets it would be $4,500 instead of $4,000. But uh, comparing that to the other ones, which were under $1,500, it was three times the price of the other houses they had already built in the colony. So that tells you some of the quality that went into that building and just the really nice uh, layout that was inside, the interior, the size of the building. So it was a, it was a very impressive structure, of course, and they'd want that for being able to uh, have their on-site showroom. We have the showroom for the Orangeville Colony. Their main one was in J Street, uh, down in Sacramento. So they would have people come into Sacramento, they would come to the J Street office, they'd talk to them about it. And then they would want to have uh, folks come out for a dog and pony show, come out to the villa and go look at the tracks. So this was their, their uh, on-site base to wine and dine the prospective buyers and show them the great property that's available here, the potential of these orchards, and of course the beautiful views from the bluff, all those to hopefully then sell all these parcels that they were looking to uh, get rid of as a part of their real estate transactions. And what you'll see here is uh, they had a, a caretaker, Mrs. Wilkinson. Uh, what I found interesting in the um, annual report is they didn't, uh, typically in those days, the husband's name was used with the missus. So it'd be Mrs. Bob Wilkinson or Mrs. John Wilkinson. They didn't have his name for some reason. I thought that was interesting. Um, the other thing I found interesting is uh, when the, oh, let me go back. When the, um, the colony company dissolved in 1905. I found a news article where uh, a Mrs. Wilkerson was getting a marriage license and moving to Chicago or something like that. So it was, <laughs> she, she, once she got her gig done with the villa and being the uh, the B and B, I guess, manager for uh, for the colony, uh, she went ahead and, and moved off into somewhere else. So it was a. She'd become a wealthy and thus marriageable. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, she was. She had something else to do uh, after the 1905 shutdown of the colony um, operations. But she was the one that helped uh, bring everybody in, make sure they were fed, and uh, make sure the rooms were all clean. They had the. It was like a small hotel. They had multiple rooms there to, to house people. Uh, there were people that would come. They'd buy a track. They hadn't bought their or built their house yet. Uh, there was a number of people that hung out in the villa while their house was being built. Uh, so it was used for multiple different purposes. We had people coming up for the weekend, right? Because there was a beautiful view. You had a hotel. They could come up and hang out at the villa, have a nice picnic on the bluff, go down and see Fern Glen, which we'll uh, have to get into a little bit more at some point. Um, it's mentioned a few times. It's an interesting place we'll, we don't have time to get into today, but it's one of the views around here. And then... You can see they had promotional materials in the papers that say, hey, for a buck, you can get a train ticket from Sacramento up to Folsom. We'll drive you over in a carriage over to Orangevale. We'll show you the sites. You can have a good time at the villa. And so they were able to uh, advertise and try to use the, uh, the villa as part of their promotional uh, thing, along with offering transportation and a nice lunch and those kind of things. So then, of course, in 1905, the company dissolved. And at that point, the villa was no longer needed for what it was originally built for. So what was next? What was next is we're going to talk about the location first, <laughs> the original location. It's, there's so many different things to talk about uh, with the villa. It's, it, it was kind of hard to decide which way to kind of go through it. Yeah. <laughs> so the original location. As you look at the map back here, and after the meeting, go ahead and come up to the map, take a look at it. There's, it's, it makes a lot more sense as you get more and more information, as you start connecting the dots and having more data points with Orangevale, these maps start making more and more sense. It's very interesting. Uh, but in the bottom right corner, you see something different, right? You have all these 10 acre parcels, the nice little squares. You got the roads going east and west, north and south. But in the bottom right corner, there's this very dense area. And you're like, what, what was that? And that was the town site that they had proposed 
and didn't actually complete. The only thing that got completed was the villa. They didn't uh, do any of the roads. The only road was there was the villa. None of the other stuff got done. Uh, what we found out later in 1909 with Hullings, he tried to bring back the Orangevale Bluffs as a new uh, development on the Bluffs. Uh, that failed as well because they couldn't get the railroad uh, finished up to come through here. That was a key part, was having a railroad nearby in those days to be able to have transportation, be able to you know go back and forth to Sacramento, um, being able to get goods and services back and forth. So without that, or that railroad into Orangevale, which they had promoted originally and again in 1909, it was, uh, it was really tough to make that town site a, a, a reality, being so close to Folsom. Because right? Folsom had a road, or a railroad, and it was, it was pretty nearby. So it was very tough. So the villa ended up being the only thing that was developed at the time. Uh, so you're asking, uh, Pam, you're asking about a, uh, maybe a school was there? I remember reading something, or was that more in Ashland than that area? I didn't see anything in this specific area. There, there is a, a school on the proposed map, but I haven't seen anything personally. But it's something we could definitely dig into more. Yep. But uh, yeah, if they'd gotten a school, and we had the Orangevale School and the, the um, Robert School. So I'd, I'd be surprised if there was a third school at the time. I just saw the sign when I saw it, so I was just yeah. curious. Yeah, so, so far all I know is about the villa, but we'll update if we do find something about a school that's nearby there. All right, so, so you can see here, we're gonna we'll look at this area, right? This is like where the villa was. So I've zoomed in on this, and over here on the, the right, you can see the Grand View Hotel and Park. There's a, a nice little section here. It was next to the bluff. There was Grand View Avenue that was gonna run right on the edge of the bluff. So you had the roadway on the edge of the bluff, and then you had the park and the hotel further off the bluff where it would be. Um, so with that information, and across the top here, you have uh, originally Orangevale Avenue. That's now Greenback Lane. All right. This is uh, called Fifth Street on the map. That's Main Avenue. You have Walnut and then Cherry, which is now Chestnut. So when you look at these names, you can see a few tweaks like, oh, wait a second, how does that work out? But that gives you a little translation as we look at this with uh, the next map. So let's look at a current map of Google. It's Google Maps, and I've got the same general area. You have the, the bluff here, right here in Orangevale. This is the Orangevale Bluff. Here is uh, the, the river coming around the bend. You have Greenback Lane coming up here, Greenback across here, and of course Madison down this way and then your main walnut and chestnut. So if I overlay, so I, I scale that old style map and I overlay it with the Google map and line up the streets, it's hard to see, but I've, I've actually got it here in transparency. You can see the, the water lines running down main here, and here's the red line running down walnut. So those were the water lines they had planned for the property. And what that does is it lines up that hotel view park right here on the bluff, just south of this building here. That's an old motel, which is now an apartment complex. And just below that is Overwood Court. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's asphalt. <laughs> so unlike the Thorpe residence, where we could find a nice big, you know, couple of pillars laying in the grass, um, <clears throat> you go there and it's the cul-de-sac, right, for Overwood Court, and there are duplex houses that whole area is duplexes. It that amazes me being on the bluff and just the, the views there. I was surprised that that didn't become a, a much more upscale kind of neighborhood. But there, it's a lot of, um, of duplexes in that area. Just at the time in the 50s, I believe, that's what they put there. <clears throat> so you go on that court, that's, that's where the villa was. And a further confirmation of that, <clears throat> this is a note that was on the back of the photograph of the villa in the Sacramento room. So I, I, I pulled out the picture of the villa and I flip it over and somebody had written a, a sticky note. They didn't sign it. It's anonymous. But it talks about the villa being specifically at modern Overwood Court. So it does jive with the mapping that uh, I ended up doing and trying to figure out exactly where it was. So very, 
very cool, and they had some other notes about the, somebody was informed about the villa, and they put some notes on it, and then we have no idea who, who actually put it there, and we don't have any other primary sources uh, to, to source with that, but uh, that's what we have to go with this, and I think that's a pretty solid case for Overwood Court being the location of the villa. So, very cool. That is a bad ass. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So the views from Original Bluff. I went up just to, you know, I was looking for, of course, those pillars again, right? Trying to find some more pillars like the Thorpe Mansion. <clears throat> and, uh, we, I found the asphalt court. Uh, I walked around. Sand, uh, I think it's Sandy Court has an access point onto the trail. There's a nice trail that I didn't even know existed on the bluff. You can, people are riding their bikes along the bluff. Uh, so that, that it's all uh, either county or uh, part of the, the park system. Uh, right on the bluff there and so I took a, a picture from roughly where if you were on the property for the villa where you would have been looking out over the river and over to Folsom all right so a very nice view very nice view I, I, I liked it Is that uh, that's the new bridge the new Folsom bridge uh, yeah rainbow bridge is behind it a little bit further down but you can see the the nice hills here over here you can see the mountains in the back it's a really beautiful view and so I was like, okay, well, what did they, what were they looking at? Do we have anything that gave us an idea of what they had? Huh. And we have that. It's on our wall right there, if you haven't noticed. There's a guy sitting, I thought it was next to a lake. Come over here and take a look at it at some point. Yeah, take a look. This is the picture on the big promo for Orangevale Colony. And there's this guy sitting in an oak tree, and I thought he was, you know, looking over a lake. Maybe it was the reservoir or something. You know, I'd, I was like, I, I didn't know until I looked at that picture, and then I looked at the picture I have, and I'm like, wait a second, that's the same hill, yep. same hill. Here's the hills over here, All right? And then you have the shoreline coming for Folsom, and he's looking at Folsom. And in fact. Afterwards, come over here, look underneath the picture, and there is tiny little letters right down here. If you read that, it says, Folsom and American River from Grand Hotel site. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, we can't see, can we? I mean, how long has that been sitting on the wall, the Chamber of Commerce, and we haven't noticed that that's what that picture was about? Yeah, so Yeah, so Yeah, Pam was mentioning the the views that we 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 tracked those those hills on the uh, the Thorpe house. We've uh, we've seen that same view, right? So it's it's helping us here again. All right. So next question is the villa a clone? Right? Uh, some of us already know the answer to this, so don't spoil it. Plus we can't hear you on the microphone. <laughs> but uh, talking a little bit about the architecture. Uh, what we found, it's mentioned as a Swiss villa, but the East Lake Victorian architecture is something that was mentioned in the, one of the documents for the move. Uh, I talked to the current owner of the villa, and he mentioned the East Lake architecture. I was like, I need to look into this. And it is a, a, a sub part of the Queen Anne style of Victorian architecture. And uh, so when you see the Queen Anne from the Calders, that was built a little bit, probably eight to ten years after this one. Um, so it was a little bit later Queen Anne. But uh, it's an East Lake Victorian style. They have very ornate um, pillars and different uh, ornaments. And we've seen the villa, and you've seen the pictures, and you've seen this type of architecture on that. Well, here's the clone. <laughs> In uh, Southern California, there is uh, pretty much an exact replica of the villa that you can go see in San Pedro. And when, when uh, Pam had shared this on Facebook uh, previously, uh, and it had been shared, the picture had been confused with the villa. Somebody had posted, I think, the... Yeah, I love Orangevale, right? Somebody posted a picture of this house instead of the actual villa. And it was like, oh, no, that one's in Los Angeles. Like, wait a second, why is there a second one? And, and which one was built first? Well, based on the information about the Dodson home, this, this family in itself, this is a whole other history project you can research. Fascinating. 
uh, Sepulveda family. They owned one of the huge Mexican land grants down in Southern California, included San Pedro and a whole bunch of that LA area. Very rich family. The, the, so the, the father decided to um, give a wedding gift to his daughter and buy, build a nice little house. <laughs> so he built, he built the original villa because they were married in 1881. And uh, the villa would have been built uh, after the colony came, you know, 1888, 1889, right? We had the annual report that existed in 1889. So this is actually the original villa, uh, but in Southern California, the only difference that is really obvious is the um, stairs are on the center, whereas the villa is on the left. And I believe there's a few more columns on the villa. The, uh, the porch is a little bit wider, um, but those are the only slight differences. Everything else is... The ornate um, pillars on the top there, all that stuff you'll see in the villa we have here today. It's very interesting. So let's talk about the post-colony years. All right, what happened to the villa after the colony uh, dissolved, the, the corporation? Well, we'll go into the Pierce years. Uh, so what happened was a uh, family, John Pierce, we, uh, we might actually have a picture of this guy. <clears throat> we have from the Fair Oaks Historical Society some pictures of a, uh, a group that came from Chicago. They were sitting in the orchards, and I think I had shared one of these photos on the Facebook group. But they're hanging out in these orchards, and they, they went through Orangeville on their way to Fair Oaks, and they were promoting Fair Oaks at the time. Well, John decided, hey, I like Orangeville better. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and settle in Orangeville. Well, he, uh, he comes up in the Orangeville Water Company information. He was involved in, in Orangeville in different ways. But what happened was in uh, 1906 or 1908, we don't have the exact year, he went ahead and bought the villa. He didn't like the location. Well, the views were great, but there wasn't good water rights at the time. So he was a little, he was a little worried about that. So he ended up moving it with mules and logs to uh, Greenback Lane, where it was until 1991. <clears throat> and Dot Pierce, there was a great article in the Orangeville News that helps give us a lot of information about this. So the Pierce family, it was really a, a nice synopsis of the Pierce family years. And uh, so Dot Pierce was built, uh, born in there in 1911. And uh, they had 20 acres. <clears throat> and I'll just show you here. The, uh, so where Dairy Queen is, where the Orangeville Rents is, those whole, those, both those 10 acre lots on each side of Walnut, on the north side of Greenback, were the parcels that they had. So they had 20 acres and they of course put the villa where the, uh, the star is, <clears throat> that's where it was parked until 1991. And uh, we did have a mention of Dot's Beauty Parlor in um, the Orangeville Water Company had a history that we recently discovered when we went and did some research there, Hilda's nose, and they mentioned Dot's Beauty Parlor <clears throat> that was in the villa at the time this history was written. Well, <clears throat> Dot only owned the uh, villa until 1954. So that history that was type typewritten that the Orangeville Water Company has was written pre-1954. So that was pretty cool. <clears throat> and then uh, in 1954, Dot went ahead and sold the property to Mrs. Haskins because uh, they, were, they were done. She was getting old and, and Mrs. Haskins was talking about moving into it and improving it and saying, hey, maybe we can make a history um, museum out of this or have a, have a room or something. And, and that was her thoughts at the time. And uh, so that didn't actually happen. The final greenback year is 54 to 91. We have her renovation dreams faltering. Uh, it never happened. We had uh, issues with uh, vandals, uh, hoodlums of the time, the, uh, the 60s and 70s, a lot of long hairs and all that stuff. <laughs> Pam. <laughs> Very. <laughs> So there were a lot of, a lot of folks, uh, it, was, it was not uh, lived in at the time, so there was a lot of uh, parties that went on in there, a lot of different things that went on there, and it, a lot of stuff got damaged, and people took things, and it, it got, um, got stripped pretty badly during those years. And then when we got to the, uh, the 70s, uh, an Oscar Morvai, he was a developer out of Sacramento, he bought the, uh, the property. And uh, at the time, he wasn't planning on doing anything with it for a while. So he rented it really cheap to people. And in the late 70s, he did it to the antique, the Villa Antiques. I don't know if anybody remembers the Villa Antiques uh, that was there. Okay, Pam. Uh, and I did talk to um, Larry Neal, 
who was uh, a caretaker, I guess, at night to, to watch over the villa. And he told me some interesting stories, which we don't have time to go over today. But uh, we'll get to it later, maybe in October. For his aunt that ran the villa, that the aunt yes, so Larry's aunt went ahead and, and uh, had, the, uh, had the antique shore. Yeah. All right. And then the Copleys had it in the 80s. And then they stayed there until it moved in the 91. And I did talk to uh, Judy Copley as well. Got some information from her. So we ended up with a house that looks kind of decrepit, right, in 91. We're, we're looking very bad. Uh, Oscar decided to develop the property. And it was going to be either torn down or somebody had to move it. And he was willing to give it to somebody for a buck. One dollar. But you just got, you got to move it. So what happened was, um, the state of our seniors at the time was like, well, okay, well, I guess we'll do it. We need another building at our property up on Oak Avenue. So they paid the dollar and they had to raise a whole bunch of money, 90 to $100,000, depending on your budget, to move it with Montgomery uh, House Movers and move it from its location to the Oak location. So it was quite the event. Uh, unfortunately, I did live in 91, right behind south of Greenback, and completely missed this. I, I didn't even know the villa was there, but I was in my teens, so I didn't. I knew Dairy Queen was there, but I didn't know about the villa. So I have to apologize to Orangevale. Priorities. Yes, priorities. Uh, so they moved it to Oak, and just to show you the route that it took, uh, so it was down on Greenback, down at the bottom here. There's your location. It was going up to Oak Avenue, and it's like, how are you going to get it there? Well, they ended up going back down Greenback because of trees, power lines, the size of the roads. They went around to uh, American Canyon. They went up the American Canyon and then back out Oak. So it was quite the route. Yeah, and they, it took three trucks to get it up the hills. Um, they had the truck that was, you know, the house was on, and they had to get two other trucks to help push it up the hills. So that was a quite, the, quite the feat. So once it got there, there was a lot of renovation to do, right? You saw the picture of how bad it was. And so Serve Our Seniors was raising funds. The community was chipping in and raising funds. They had estimates from 150 to 400,000 to get that back to um, full snuff. And so that took, it took seven years to get it to where it was in 1998. And there was a lot of elbow grease that went in there, a lot of contributions. There were a lot of... Um, campaigns, those kind of things to help with that. Lots of volunteers. And they mentioned there was going to be a history room in the villa. Was there a history room, Pam? They started it. Um, Atomich had uh, given, a, Tom had given a lot of stuff that was spread out on tables, and that was kind of the beginning. It was outside of the kitchen area. I volunteered there. I used to work there every Friday for right. our seniors. But they were working on it and getting it to all the time. Okay. So, so Pam just mentioned that we had uh, a lot of stuff there already from Tomich and whatnot, and there was uh, a start to a history room. So that's, that's good to hear. I don't know whatever happened to all those things, but he had quite a collection of pictures and albums. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And we'll, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we're talking to the owner right now, and he does have some stuff. Okay. So that's good. All right. So <laughs> I don't know if this was maybe part of the reason, Server so seniors went bankrupt. There were some other interesting reasons we won't go into today, but uh, they ended up going bankrupt in 2000. And as part of that bankruptcy, the present owner was able to procure the, the house. He, as a youngster, would drive his bike by it on Greenback Lane, and he always liked the villa. And so when he saw it became available, he wanted it. And he's been living there since, um, since 2003. Less. Yeah, so Les is in the house right now, and uh, he has some stuff, so eventually we'll have the research team go help him look through some of the information he has, because Server Seniors pretty much uh, dumped and run uh, when they left the facility. So, yeah, it was very odd. Uh, so it's in good hands, and uh, a picture from last Saturday is the villa right here, and uh, in its current uh, glory. So it is still... Uh, in decent shape, he said he needs to put some paint on the front. I did go talk to him and got the pictures. And uh, he was busy tonight. I did invite him, but uh, he couldn't make it tonight. But he'll probably uh, uh, join in and, and watch this on our YouTube channel. So 
That was uh, very cool. So we're hoping for more history hiding inside. That's coming. We're always looking for more volunteers to join the different teams we have. Um, I haven't gone inside, but uh, yeah, we'll eventually get in there. So that's, uh, that's where we're at right now. So the villa is currently looking great and uh, on Oak Avenue next to Telegraph. So uh, thank you so much. Yeah. You drove by there, okay, yeah. So it's a great part of Orangeville history. Uh, we'll continue next uh, month. I believe we're gonna go do the William Randolph Hearst house, the one that William Randolph Hearst built in Orangevale. So that'll be a good presentation next month as well. Always good stuff in Orangevale. So we're glad to have you as part of the Orangevale History Project and uh, thanks for listening. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.